Hi, Matthias from 10 Minute Physics here. Welcome to tutorial number 9. Today I will introduce you to Extended Position Based Dynamics or XPBD. With that I will show you how to handle general, not just distance constraints. This will allow us to simulate a large variety of objects and phenomena in a very simple way. If you don't use 3D math very often, I highly recommend to watch tutorial number 7 first. Other than that, this tutorial is self-contained. Let's start. This tutorial will be quite technical. You might want to watch it multiple times. I also provide the slides so you can go through them in your own speed. After this tutorial, we are equipped with all the knowledge we need to write some really cool demos. For the slides and all the information about my channel, check out matthiasmuller.info slash 10 minute physics. Let me first motivate the method. Let's assume we have two bodies that are overlapping with a penetration depth of D. In a force based simulation, we compute the separating force F, which is proportional to the penetration depth D. They are related via a scalar K, which is also called the stiffness. When the forces are applied, they change the velocities. Eventually, the velocities change the positions. As you can see, we need an overlap for the bodies to separate. Also, there is a reaction lag. To make objects look stiff, we need a large stiffness coefficient k. This, however, introduces stability problems and overshooting. Small values of k make the system squishy. A big problem is how to set k to simulate a hard constraint. As we will see in PBD, we work with compliance, which is the inverse of stiffness. For hard constraints, we can simply set it to zero, which corresponds to an infinitely big stiffness. Many rigid body engines use an impulse-based simulation. Here the penetrations are only detected. Then an impulse is applied to make the velocities separating. When the new velocities are applied, the bodies separate. This approach is more stable. The velocity update is controlled and does not yield any overshooting problems. The disadvantage of this approach is drift, because we only work with velocities. Consistent velocities do not guarantee consistent positions. Additional tricks are needed to fix this problem. Now let's have a look at the position-based dynamics approach. Here we also just detect the penetrations. Then we directly change the positions of the objects to remove the overlap. Finally, to get a dynamic system, we need to update the velocities accordingly. We have a controlled position change, which yields an unconditionally stable simulation. And we don't have the drift problem of impulse-based approaches. What people often ask is whether PBD is physical and accurate. PBD has had the reputation of being unphysical and inaccurate. However, we found that it is closely related to implicit Euler integration. This is a very popular method because it is unconditionally stable. To be precise, position-based dynamics corresponds to the first iteration of the Newton minimization of a backward Euler integration step in variational position-based form using the nonlinear Gauss-Seidel method, where the Newton solution is initialized with the unconstrained predicted inertial position using external forces. Don't get confused, this is a very complicated description of a very simple method. The original position-based dynamics approach is only unphysical in the way it handles softness. Fortunately, we could fix this problem with XPBD, extended position-based dynamics, as we will see. Let us now start with a simple example, a bead on a wire. We looked into this problem already in tutorial number 5. Let's assume we have a bead with position x and velocity v and we want it to stay on the wire. The first step is integration. For this we use an explicit Euler integration step. We multiply the velocity times the time step size and add it to the position. x is now the position where the bead would be without the constraint of staying on the wire. It's also called the unconstrained position. Next, we solve the constraint by moving the bead to the closest position on the wire. Finally, we update the velocity as the current position minus the previous position divided by delta t. As you can see, position-based dynamics is an integrator and a solver at the same time. Here is the algorithm for a set of particles. The original PBD works with particles only. They can be used to simulate cloths of bodies, ropes, hair, fluids and more. 
Rigid objects can theoretically be simulated with particles as well, but not in an elegant way. We extended position-based dynamics to handle rigid bodies as single entities. I will show you how in a later tutorial. Now let's assume we have a set of particles with positions xi and velocities vi. We first perform the integration by iterating through all the particles. For each particle we add gravity times the time step size delta t to the velocity. Then we store the current position in the previous position. Next we add delta t times the velocity to the current position. Next we iterate through all the constraints and solve each one. Finally we iterate through all the particles again and update the velocities as the current position minus the previous position divided by delta t. Solving a constraint means computing a correction vector delta x for all particles participating in the constraint. After computing the correction vectors delta x we apply them to the current positions. If multiple interwined constraints are present, then solving them only once per time step yields stretchy objects. Implicit solvers typically run through all the constraints multiple times. We can do that too by putting an iteration loop around the constraint solving loop. In this case we run through all the constraints n times at each time step. This indeed makes constraints less stretchy. However, we made a fascinating and very useful observation. Instead of spending the time on multiple iterations, it is much better to run multiple substeps. In each substep we solve all the constraints only once. In this case we need to adjust the time step to be delta t over the number of substeps. The difference in convergence rate is really astonishing. It made all our work on increasing convergence like hierarchical position-based dynamics or long-range attachment constraints obsolete. There is an additional benefit of taking only one iteration. In XPBD we need to keep track of a Lagrange multiplier per constraint. This is not necessary if we use a single iteration. Let's start with a very simple constraint, a distance constraint. Let's assume we have two particles at position x1 and x2 a rest distance L0 and the current distance L. The particles have masses M1 and M2. We use the letter W to represent 1 over the mass. In the position based dynamics we simply move the particles such that the distance constraint of L being L0 is satisfied. Here are the two equations for the correction vectors delta x1 and delta x2. They look complicated but they are very simple. This vector here is the vector from x1 to x2 normalized. We multiply this vector by the error L minus L0 and then we distribute the error according to the inverse masses of the particles. This makes sense. Let's assume one particle is attached to a wall. Then we assign a mass of infinity to this particle, which corresponds to a W of 0. This means this particle is not moved at all and all the work is done by the other particle. Now let's have a look at how we can solve general constraints. In this case we have a number of n particles that participate in the constraint. First we define a constraint function which takes as input the positions of all the particles participating in the constraint. This function produces a scalar value c which is the constraint error. c is zero exactly when the constraint is satisfied. For a distance constraint we can define the constraint function as follows. Here we compute the actual distance between the particles and subtract the rest distance which is exactly zero when the constraint is satisfied. Now we need a very important concept, the gradient of a constraint function. Let's assume we have a very simple constraint function which tells us that the distance between a particle and origin of the coordinate system needs to be L0. This simple diagram shows the situation. Here we have the origin of the coordinate system and here we have the particle. For all positions on this circle the constraint is satisfied because the distance between this point and the origin of the coordinate system is L0. The locations where the constraint function is 1 is also a circle. The same for the location where the constraint function is minus 1. The gradient of the constraint function is a vector. It points into the direction in which c increases the most. In our case this is the direction that points away from the origin. The length of the gradient is how much c changes when we move x by one unit. 
In our case, if we move x by one unit, the distance to the origin also increases by one unit. Now we can easily compute the gradient of our distance constraint function. It's the vector x normalized. Now let's see how we can solve a general constraint using position-based dynamics. First, we have to compute a scalar value lambda, which is the same for all participating particles. Lambda can be computed as minus the constraint function evaluated at the current position, divided by the sum of the inverse masses times the lengths of the gradients squared. The gradient ci tells us how to move xi for a maximal increase of c. This expression here is the squared length of the gradient ci. Once we have lambda, we can easily compute the correction vector for each particle. We take the gradient ci and multiply it by the inverse mass of the particle times lambda. Since these two are just scalars, this means the correction vector points in the direction of the gradient. Since we want the constraint function to be zero, we have to decrease it, and that's the reason why we have a minus sign here. So far, we have only looked at hard constraints. What if we want to make a constraint soft, for instance, to simulate a soft body? In original position-based dynamics, we simply scaled the correction vectors by a scalar k. k is a number between zero and one. If we set it to zero, we omit the constraint. If we set it to one, we have a hard constraint, but we can select values between zero and one. This is very easy to tune. However, the effect of this scaling is dependent on the time step size. Constraints become stiffer for smaller time step sizes. We fixed this problem with XPBD or extended position-based dynamics. Fortunately, it is very simple to apply correct physical stiffness. All we need to do is add this little term to the computation of lambda. Here alpha is the compliance, which is the inverse of physical stiffness. If we set alpha to zero, we have an infinitely stiff constraint and recover the original equation from position-based dynamics. Now let me give you an example to show you that these equations are not as complicated as they seem. What we're going to do is we're going to recover the equations for the distance constraint using the general formulas. Again, we have two particles at position x1 and x2, and we want the mutual distance between the two particles to be L0. Now the question is, what are the gradients of this constraint function? We have to ask how we have to move particle 1 to maximally increase the distance between the two particles. Obviously, the direction of the gradient points along the line between the two particles. The length of the gradient is 1, because if we move particle 1 by 1 unit, the distance between the two particles also grows by 1 unit. Here are the equations how to compute the gradients. What we do is we compute the vector between the two particles and normalize it. Now we can plug these two gradients into the computation of lambda. We only have two terms because we only have two particles and the length of the gradients are 1. Therefore, we end up with w1 plus w2 in the denominator. In the numerator, we have to evaluate the constraint function at the current position. This is the current distance between the two particles minus the rest distance. Once we have lambda, we can compute the correction for particle 1. It's lambda times w1 times the gradient of particle 1. This is the equation for lambda, here I put w1, and here is the gradient for particle 1. This is exactly the equation we had for the distance constraint. The nice thing is that with the general equations, we can now also formulate a volume conservation constraint. Such a constraint is important to simulate soft bodies, for instance. So let's assume we have a tetrahedron with adjacent particles 1, 2, 3, and 4. The constraint function is 6 times the current volume of the tetrahedron minus its rest volume. I put the 6 here to make the equations a little bit simpler. However, the constraint function is still 0 exactly when the current volume is equal to the rest volume. In tutorial 7, I showed you how to compute the volume of a tetrahedron. Using this equation, we can now expand the constraint function to be a function of the positions of the four particles. The question is, what are the gradients of this function? Let's have a look at particle 4. The question is, in which direction do we have to move the particle to maximally increase the volume? Obviously, this direction is perpendicular to the base triangle. We can compute the vector that is perpendicular to this triangle using a cross product. Here we compute the cross product of the vectors from particle 1 to 2 and particle 1 to 3. 
This cross product not only gives us the correct direction of the gradient, but fortunately also the correct length. With the right hand rule, we can now compute the gradients of the constraint function with respect to all four particles. These turn out to be very simple expressions. Now we can plug the constraint function as well as the gradients into our general equation for lambda. Once we have lambda, we can now compute the correction vectors for all four particles adjacent to the tetrahedron. To see these equations in action, have a look at the upcoming tutorial about soft body simulation. Thanks for watching and I see you in the next tutorial.